Today I'm chatting with a fellow Linux content creator and a, a real Linux and free and open source software enthusiast, Jack Kiefer. Jack, how are you doing? Hey, Derek. I'm doing great. Thanks for having me on. Yeah, it's great. I, I've been you know, wanting to invite you on for a little while. The other day I caught your video where you were running through a DTOS installation. And somebody in your comment section mentioned, hey, you two should do something together on camera. And I was like, yeah, that's great. So I sent you a message <laughs> you know, after watching that video. I was like, yeah, we should do something on camera together. I don't do enough of these collaborative kind of videos with, with other content creators because you know, I've recorded probably nearly 1,400 videos. And probably 10 of them maybe have been these kinds of things. So it's a very small percentage of what I do. And I know... You know, especially viewers love these kinds of interactions because you get conversations that you otherwise wouldn't if you're just talking to yourself. So tell uh, my viewers who may not be familiar with you, Jack, uh, what you're all about, what your what your channel is about, the topics you discuss. Well, you know, I do, of course, Linux stuff and I do a lot of uh, first look and reviews on Linux and uh, dis different distros. I guess I really kind of uh, geared myself towards the distro hopper. There's a lot of people out there that, that are just like constant distro hoppers. And, uh, you know, I never considered myself one, but since I started doing these videos, uh, I kind of find out that I do that myself sometimes. I get looking over these things and then I'm like... Uh, wow, you know, I want to run that for a while. So mm -hmm. I end up having computers set aside where I'm running a different distro on it every week, probably just to kind of <laughs> get to know this stuff. And, you know, when I first started out my channel, I, I was mostly covering programming stuff uh, using open source uh, Lazarus. And so I would create tutorials and just kind of, you know, I think my first tutorial was something like uh, uh, scraping a website and pulling yeah. pictures. And uh, yeah, I'm looking yeah. at your channel now. Yeah, some of your earlier stuff was uh, yeah, a lot of more nerdy stuff as far as yeah, setting up uh, you know, server applications, things like that. Uh, I noticed also you did a lot more with things like uh, internet marketing. You know, a lot of so web-based stuff you were doing back then, or. Oh, right. Yeah. In fact, way back in 2005, I was pretty much exclusively internet marketing and creating info products. In fact, one of my first info products was uh, uh, a Van Halen uh, <laughs> video, how to play eruption. Yeah. And so I would take you step by step uh, through how to play eruption in that video. And I think I sold it on eBay at first. That was way back when eBay uh, would allow you to sell digital content. And well, heck, you you must have been one of the earlier channels on YouTube because these videos are nearly 15 years old. <laughs> the, the, yeah. the oldest videos about the, your internet marketing videos on your channel. In fact, I think I got on YouTube even before uh, Google got involved. Yeah, that would have been before they had it, yeah. Yeah, that was a while ago. Mm -hmm. And, of course, back then, you know, I didn't have, you know, like a, a whole line of videos. I pretty much used YouTube to archive my videos for my internet business blog. And so it was kind of an archiving place at the time. Uh, but yes, I mean, some of those videos, the video quality on them are pretty bad. <laughs> uh, but you, you never make a good first video for sure. Oh, no, no. Huh. In fact, when I, uh, it was actually in 2020, 2020 or 2021 when I first actually started kind of getting serious into creating content mm -hmm. on YouTube consistently. And I got to tell you, it was pretty awkward. I remember my first couple of videos, it was a strange feeling to sit in front of a camera and just talk to it without anyone on the other end. Yeah. Yeah. It's, I, I hear from people all the time that want advice on how to start a YouTube channel. Like, yeah, I don't want to be one of these YouTubers that look back a couple of years later at their first video. And man, that's so bad. And it's like, trust me, it's going to be bad. There's nothing you can do. You're not going to be good on that first video. Just record it. Just get it done. 
That's right. Yeah, it's a rite of passage. Yeah. You gotta, you just got to go. got to have really grainy video, like 480p video that was recorded off a, a 10-year-old cell phone. It's got to have really thin, tinny audio that was recorded on the cheapest lavalier mic that you could buy at the time. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, I've been there, done that. No. Sure. And uh, one thing that helps, though, is listening to feedback from your commenters. Uh, a lot of times somebody will comment in there and say, wow, your audio is awful. Or, <laughs> yeah, constructive you know, criticism, right? <laughs> right, right. And, and I like that. And so... Uh, yeah, sometimes oh, I can hear the heater in the background. It's driving me crazy, that noise. Mm. You got to turn it off. <laughs> Especially, I, I remember the first couple of microphones I bought were really cheap, really crappy. Also, I didn't know the difference between condenser microphones and dynamic microphones. And a lot of the really cheap stuff you'll find on store shows, a lot of those are condenser microphones. And they pick up the air conditioner the refrigerator, like they'll pick up computer fans. And, yeah. and Yeah, that's true. In fact, I'm using a dynamic mic now. I started off on a condenser and it, it was a pretty cheap mic. And you could probably hear it in some of my earlier videos. And it was a huge difference going to a dynamic for sure. Yeah, I still use a dynamic mic uh, if, if I record at the, the house, which I don't do that often, but... Um, if somebody's mowing their yard while I'm recording a video at my house on that, that condenser mic, yeah, you'll, you'll hear the mower. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, for sure. Yeah. I um, noticed, uh, obviously you, you cover a lot of Linux videos on your channel these days, but do you ever use windows or Mac or, or any of that stuff at all? Or are you strictly Linux these days? Well, you know, I have an old MacBook still that's from, probably 2010 it's it's pretty old but uh it's still laying around and i do like mac i've worked on a lot of macs back in the day when i was a, a technician uh, i worked on both mac and windows uh i do my son has a windows computer he's a gamer so he's like really into all this stuff for right. Fortnite and you know all the games so oh, yeah Fortnite, you can't run on linux so you'd have to run it on windows all right right and we tried the whole linux thing there and it just wasn't working for him so uh no because there's always going to be the one game the one game that doesn't work you know, and that'll be the one they want to play so that's right and he found it <laughs> <Right>. <laughs> so yeah he's on the gaming computer but i am really impressed with you know the progress that that Linux is kind of making with gaming, but so many of these games are just proprietary for Windows. And so Windows really is the only logical platform to use for a lot of these games. Well, really, they're all proprietary for Windows. It's really these these workarounds, these hacks with uh, Proton and Vulkan, you know, that really Steam is, is basically making these Windows-only games work on Linux for us. But yeah, there's not there's not enough companies that actually cater to Linux as a first class citizen. It's always an afterthought. If somebody can hack it, you know, hack on it and make it work on Linux, that's fine. If they can't, well, we don't care. Yeah, that's true. You know, and that's like, the problem with the games that use the in, uh, easy anti cheat. Then that's and I think that's the problem with Fortnite and some of the other popular games that just will not run on Linux. Is easy anti cheat will not run on any operating system that's not a windows operating system right that and it will actually detect if you're in a vm it'll detect if you're using wine and it won't run it has to be legit windows on bare metal yeah i mean how about that you know mm -hmm. no cheat yeah well more than that <laughs> yeah. I, i'm glad they're worried about you know gamers cheating but you know might want to cater to the people that want to run it on Linux or even Mac for that matter. But yeah, that's true. And I, I used windows for years. I mean, uh, my very first computer of course was running DOS 622. And back then I was, I was terminal all the way. I mean, I think, uh, windows 3.1 and windows for work group 3.11 was the thing back then. 
But even when Windows 98 came out, I still spent most of my time in the terminal. I really liked DOS and DOS shell. And I was a kind of a terminal guy for a long time. It took me a while to really warm up to Windows. And you like programming and basic and you know, stuff like that back in the day. Is that what you were right, doing? Right. Assembly. <laughs> Assembly. <laughs> Which I never got great at. I, I, I figured you for a, a, a Pascal kind of person. Yes. Yes. Yeah. Pascal. Uh, that was something. And Delphi. I remember mm -hmm. Portland Delphi was just one of my favorite IDEs. And also C++ Builder was one that I really enjoyed. And Borland, I thought, just had some great stuff out there. Yeah. And yeah, that's uh, a blast from the past. I'd forgot all about Borland. Yeah, and those were back in the days when alternative operating systems, I was exploring things like, uh, uh, oh, I forgot what it's called, BOS. Yep. BOS. Yeah, you had, uh, and... And we well, actually there were several alternative operating systems that sprung up in in the nineties, but the only one that really had any lasting power, of course, is Linux. Oh, that's right. Yeah, I mean, and I think my first Linux distro was probably that I stumbled across. Probably was a, a Red Hat, most likely. You know what year that would have been? Probably, man, it must have been late nineties. Probably 98, 99. Uh, yeah. That's probably know. about the time I would have knew what Linux was, too. Uh, I, I got into it around 96, 97, when the World Wide Web was becoming a thing. And uh, playing around with web servers, wanting to build my own websites and things like that. They, the, even the early days of the web, everybody was putting those things on Linux servers. You know, it's this new operating system that nobody, some people were using Windows Server, but you know, it quickly became dominated by Linux, that the whole web server market. You know, that's something I'm kind of curious about. Uh, what? You know, I, I, I seem to recall from some of your earlier videos that you said uh, that back in the day you were kind of more involved in retail. And yeah. I've worked kind of in retail like for a long time. Right, right. Mm -hmm. So it made me kind of curious as to uh, what it was. How, how did you end up on your first Linux distro? Was that something you just stumbled across while you were traipsing around the Internet? Or? Well, I, I mean, I like I said, I knew what Linux was 25 years ago. And when I was late teens or so in the mid-90s, and the World Wide Web was a thing, you know, AOL was becoming popular and everybody wanted to be on the Internet. And I was one of those kids. I wanted to build my own websites. So that's how I, I figured out what Linux was, because even back then, you know, you'd have to remote into a, a Linux server and, and set things up. And it, it was a lot different than it is now. A lot of these web hosting services, they've automated a lot of stuff for you. But back in the day, you'd get your password to SSH into a server and then, hey, go to the command line, start installing whatever you want to install and and hope it works at the end of the day. <laughs> yeah. But Linux on the desktop, I switched full time to Linux on the desktop in 2008 because my Windows computer was taken over by ransomware. Oh, that's always fun. Yeah. yeah. And it, it made me mad to the point where... I just, I already knew what Linux was. I'd been playing with it on servers. And sometimes I'd install it on test equipment. Uh, I played around with the Ubuntu live CDs. And back then, Ubuntu had their Wubi installer, W-U-B-I installer, which is kind of like a virtual machine, but not really. But it was where you can install Ubuntu kind of as a program on top of Windows. And you could run Ubuntu in this little virtual machine on Windows. So I, I knew... Yeah. The programs that were already installed on Ubuntu back then, and I knew I could get all my work done because I was already in, even on Windows, I mostly used free and open source software back then. I had, I had never used Internet Explorer as a browser. The whole time I'd used Windows, I was Netscape Navigator originally in the early days of the web. Yeah. And then when Microsoft killed Netscape and Mozilla started and created Firefox, I was Firefox user on day one. I just, I never used any of the proprietary browsers. So that was easy when I switched to Linux. I was already using Firefox. 
I was already using OpenOffice, which now is LibreOffice. Never used Microsoft Office. I was already using GIMP, right? So GIMP is a standard. Um, so it was real easy for me that, you know, when my Windows XP machine was taken over by ransomware, I was like, well, yeah, I've already been playing with this Linux thing. I know I could live in it. Let me just get rid of this headache because I'm tired of the viruses and, and the malware and all the spyware and everything. And, and it's much worse probably now as far as the spyware that Microsoft puts in their operating system. So because that was, what, 15 years ago. And now it's well known, especially with Windows 10 and now Windows 11, that Microsoft has a lot of built in spyware and key loggers and things. They're just tracking everything you do on that particular operating system. And just for privacy reasons, I'm, I'm glad th that I made that switch so long ago. Yeah, definitely. And by the way, you never did pay me for that ransomware back then. I, no. I didn't forget that. Yeah, and n nobody got paid for that. <laughs> I, mean, I, I was so angry. I remember it's like this guy is it's a pop up message comes up. Hey, your computer has a virus. If you pay this amount of money to you know, this person, you'll get the antivirus. It's like, what? Yeah, <laughs> that's the kind of stuff. It's like there's no way, even if he, all he wanted was a dollar. I'm not paying a dollar for for your antivirus. It's like, yeah. yeah, let's just format the drive and start all over. As a principle of the thing. Oh, yeah. And, you know, I I, I kind of went over full time to Linux probably back in, eh, I think it was around 2012, 2011, something like that, when I just kind of made the switch completely. And I can kind of relate to that because I was pretty much using open source stuff except for Photoshop. That yeah. was the only thing uh, I... At the time, I didn't like GIMP. I couldn't relate to it. And finally, I just kind of, when I switched over to to Linux, uh, Photoshop, you could kind of run the older version in Wine. But I thought, you know, it's kind of time to see if I can maybe transition over to GIMP and uh, kind of cut loose the old proprietary Photoshop. And once I really got into GIMP and really took a couple of tutorials and understood yeah. how you did the layering and so forth. You've, and you've got to watch videos. It's one of those things, GIMP does have a learning curve. And like if you watch or you go to the GIMP website, they have articles that talk you through some of the things. And it starts to make sense where at first, none of it makes sense. Right. And that's where I was. Mm -hmm. None of it made sense. And But once I got through a couple videos, and I think the GIMP website was kind of where I started, uh, Wow, you know, in about a half an hour, everything started to click. And within a week or so, I ended up liking GIMP better than Photoshop, actually. I did, too. Uh, I hadn't used Photoshop much um, many years ago. And before that, I used some other proprietary programs, uh, similar like Paint Shop Pro back in the day and other things like that. And, yeah, I found GIMP, yeah, once you learn it, it's like, oh, this is easy to use. Yeah. Um, well, I think what the problem was back then, in those years you're talking about, and it was the same for me when I switched, GIMP had a different interface. That was back when they still had like the three or four floating windows. Like it wasn't just one window like you would get with something like Photoshop. You would open yeah. GIMP and like four different floating windows with different tool sets would appear on the screen. And that was weird. That, I hated that. that. Yeah. yeah. In fact, that was one thing that put me off with the Lazarus when I was programming is when you installed it uh, by default, nothing's docked. It's all just kind of floating around. You got all these loose windows yeah. and I never really liked that, but it didn't take me long to figure out that you could actually dock them all together. There's a uh, few programs I, I found like that over the, the years, kind of like GIMP where you'd have all these various floating windows that are all separate from each other. And the reason that that's a problem for me these days is tiling window managers. I don't need, you know, five different windows cause they're going to get tiled and, and it's going to look all weird. Where on a floating window manager, I guess it would be okay. But for a tiling window manager, I can't use that stuff because unless I float all the windows the way they're supposed to be. Yeah, that's true. Mm -hmm. uh, I didn't even think about that in the context of the 
And actually, it's you that's gotten me more interested in window managers. Uh, a couple of videos back, I remember making a comment saying that I probably wouldn't use a window manager because it's kind of like driving a, a budget Yugo with all the very basics and nothing more. Yeah. <laughs> And, and compared to a desktop where you have everything and it's, you're just writing in comfort right off the bat. But uh, now I'm kind of taking back some of that stuff. After, especially after I evaluated DTOS a couple of times, it really kind of kind of lowered that barrier, you know, to window managers. Uh, it didn't, it, it actually enabled me to discover more things that, uh, I didn't realize about window managers. Yeah. Well, and, with DTOS, though, you get the desktop environment built for you around the window manager. Yeah. Oh. Exactly. Because every desktop environment is essentially the window manager plus all the extra tools you'll need. And it's, it's, it's kind of like DTOS with Xmonad. You didn't get just Xmonad. I gave you a whole bunch of other stuff to, to go along with it to, to make it work. Yeah, the Exmo bar and the right. Other. You get a panel, and you can run launcher and all this stuff. That if you're setting it up from a, like a base Arch install, you'd have to set up your pull kit program and you know session programs and heck, you'd have to install fonts. I mean, you got to install seriously everything from the ground up. So uh, yeah, video yeah. drivers I've already got as part of the script. Like if you're installing it on virtual machine or on physical equipment. I think I, I installed all the XORG drivers. <laughs> so I think. Yeah. And I love that because I've been messing with Linux for years. In fact, way back in the day, I set up a Slackware server where I worked at the time and, you know, ran Slackware in the terminal. And it was like one of my most stable servers I ever ran. Uh, no. And, you know, all this experience with Linux, uh, however, just, starting a, an X monad window manager from scratch and having to build the config, I'd have to spend hours trying to figure out. Oh, no, 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 no weeks, if not months. Uh, yeah. Okay. A yeah. Ask me how I know <laughs> <laughs> when I first, when I first uh, tried out X monad, then this was more than a decade ago. You couldn't find, obviously, uh, like video content or, you know, YouTube would have been a much smaller place. Linux content was practically non-existent, even just a few years ago on YouTube. And all you could do is go to the Internet and hope you would find somebody's config on GitHub or GitLab. But really, there just wasn't a lot of that stuff out there back then. And a lot of what I had to do in the early days, I actually learned Haskell so I could configure that massive Xmonad config of mine. And it's wow. become to the point where almost my Xmonad config, because I put so much stuff in it, um, it's a very lengthy config. It's much longer than most people's. Most people have a really tiny Xmonad config because most people don't know Haskell anyway. They're just going with the stock, with making just a few changes. And in many ways, my Xmonad config over the last few years, it's kind of become almost like documentation for some people. Like any time when somebody wants to see something with Xmonad, they go look at my config to figure out exactly how I do certain things. They take what works for them, you know, throw away the rest. And that's always what I do when I'm learning something new. I, I go find somebody that knows what they're doing, is already configured whatever piece of software. I look at their config. I take what I like. I just ignore what I don't like. I can tell you put a ton of time in that. I mean, when I look over that config and I don't know Haskell either, uh, but I'm kind of figuring it out now. When I say I, I learned Haskell, I mean, I know enough Haskell to where the code, m most of the time I can figure out what's going on in a piece of Haskell code. But it's, it's a very strange language if you'd never seen it before. Yeah, it is, you know, and, and, the nice thing about programming is once you learn one language, it's really easy to cross over and pick up other ones. Yeah. Uh, and Haskell to me is kind of like that, but it is strange too. It's got some weirdness in the syntax and so forth. There's a lot of dollar signs and a lot of periods. Right, right. Which kind of reminds me of PHP a little bit. 
kind of takes me back. And the cool thing is there's really not that many parentheses. You, you rarely see parentheses in Haskell. And the reason is because those dollar signs and periods kind of eliminate the need for some of that. Like all those dollar signs that you'll see, function, dollar sign, function, dollar sign, function, dollar sign, those are really parentheses. So function, oh. dollar sign, function is function, opening parentheses, function, closing parentheses. The dollar sign just substitutes for the opening parentheses, tack one in on the end of the line. Ah, okay. That's all it is. It's just a, a, a easier, it's actually a much easier way to write parentheses. And then you don't have to worry about nesting parentheses because you're just chaining those dollar signs in between each function. Hmm, that's pretty interesting. Yeah. Well, you know, it, it, once you know that, if somebody doesn't tell you what all those dollar signs mean, you have no idea what all that is in, in the code. No, I never would have guessed that at all. Mm -hmm. In fact, I was just assuming it was uh, uh, an indicator for a, a variable. No. And, and that's kind of going back to my PHP days, too. Mm -hmm. That was no. kind of something I messed with a little bit when I was making websites. But uh, well, I know just reverse en engineering your script there mm -hmm. uh, really makes a difference. I mean, I... I, I have to say I haven't used a lot of window managers, but I have I have not seen any configs as complete and well laid out as as what I see in the DTOS. So as somebody that's learning his way around uh, kind of how configs work in window managers and so forth and, you know, messing now I'm messing with the poly bar. Yeah with your poly bar thing there and uh, kind of getting the hang of that as well. But it really, I, I will say poly bar on X monad. It's really not designed for X monad. So there's, it, it's going to be weird. It's going to be the way it displays workspaces and things. It's, it's, it's designed for another type of window manager. Yeah. That looks like it would probably be really challenging to kind of, yeah. it, it, it's not challenging to, to get it to work. It's just not going to, to work the way you expect it. It's going to display workspaces all out of order, and um, it's just strange the way it it is. Really, Xmo bar is kind of the bar for Xmo N. Yeah, I think you might be right. When I was looking at the polybar stuff there, I wasn't even quite sure how you would even get those those workspaces to even show up on there to to be usable. Yeah, if you're on multi monitors, it's extremely annoying because you will see different workspaces in different orders on each of your monitors. It doesn't keep the same order alphabetically or numerically. Uh, it's very strange. That's a, a known bug that I think the Xmonad guys already know about, and they're going to try to patch it in the next version of the next major version of Xmonad, but who knows when that'll be released a few months, maybe a year down the road. Uh, yeah. Well, you know, you were talking about the, the fonts being, I forgot. I forgot what the and, and Xmo bar. Yeah, they they changed the way fonts are rendered uh, on the right. bars, so right. it it doesn't have uh, anti aliasing. That's the word the, I'm looking yeah, for. Yeah, which aliasing. Yeah. Which depending on the font family you choose and the font size you use, it's not that big a deal. Like it still looks okay using my config. Like it's I. I can tell the difference between the old and the new if they were side by side because one of them is definitely a little sharper and clearer than the other. But if I didn't tell you there was a difference, you might not notice. Well, you know, I got to admit, I never would have noticed. No. Uh, but but it depend on some fonts because some fonts, you know, are very sharp and blocky anyway. So, yeah, some of it would probably depend. Like I was using the Ubuntu font family. And Xmo bar, but if I was using something like Terminus, you know, with the weird blocky kind of letters, you know, oh, it'd be right. a little different. Yeah, right. But the defaults they look great. Yeah. yeah. In fact, I don't think I would even mess with that personally. One of the things with tiling window managers, you're talking about how my Xmo NAD configs kind of a massive thing, and you know, I've got a lot going on, a lot of extra code, a lot of extra functions, my own custom things going on with that. That's one of the cool things with many of the tiling window managers, if they're written and configured in a proper programming language, which many of them are, where the config file is actually written in the language that the window manager itself was written in, 
that means you can extend it however you want. So with Xmonad, if you know Haskell, you can pretty much do anything you want with Xmonad. Or if you know Python with Qtile, you could configure uh, Qtile using Python and do anything you want with it. Or the awesome window manager with Lua. It's, uh, it's configured in Lua. Okay. But some window managers have their own user-friendly syntax <laughs> that they're, they're configured in. And that's very limiting because their little syntax is not a complete language. There's only so much you can do in that config. So that would be things like i3, for example. You know, you kind of limited in what you could do in that. But most of the other ones are actually configured in a real language that, assuming you knew that language, you could get a, a lot done with it. Oh, all right. Well, you know, when I when I installed DTOS, uh, I didn't choose the option for like awesome. Uh, did you have to write the config in Lua then? Mm -hmm. Yeah, it's in Lua. Okay, so. And my awesome config is not, all right, there, there's a lot to it, but a lot of it's just standard stuff, key bindings and things. It's not, it's not as crazy pimped out the way my Xmonad config is because I actually don't really know any Lua. I mean, I kind of know a little bit how the syntax works but I'm not really comfortable with Lua. I'm actually much more comfortable with Python and the Qtile config. Now I've got a lot going on in it, if you check it out. Yeah, same here. And I love the artwork you did on the login manager there. Yeah. Uh, and actually all throughout it in the, yeah. in the console, uh, mm -hmm. the artwork, and that's really great stuff. Yeah, and I've been meaning to play around with some more uh, artwork. I need to create a custom DTOS logo. I need to create some proper branding. I've, I've got some stuff in the works. Uh, and I, I've been putting in actually a lot of work on DTOS, even since you recorded that video, trying to update a lot of things. I've, I've added a lot of packages to the repos. I've edited the installation script quite a bit. Um, because I realized the other day, and I've, I've seen a, enough people install DTOS, one of the things I didn't like was setting the locales. Because most people are not going to have that LC underscore C type variable in their locale. So why don't I just automate that process? Why do you need to go edit that file? I'm just going to pick out whatever you already have set to LC underscore Lang, and then using you know, some command line utilities like Sid or whatever. You know, I'm just going to add that line for you. So that's right. what it that's what it does now. And okay. the only thing is you would eventually still need to reboot the computer, but you've got to reboot to finish the installation of DTOS anyway. So I do all that underneath the hood now. And, you know, you don't you never even hear about the locales now on the script. Yeah, I like that. And I like the addition of the the package installs there. That's pretty cool, too. Uh, and that's something that I just noticed popped up here probably in the past week or so. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I have to rebuild a, the packages every week or two. I don't have to, but yeah, just to keep them updated. I don't have it automated to where it's on a schedule because I, I build all the packages for the DTOS repository actually on this production machine where I do my videos. And uh, I don't have this machine running all the time. And I don't want it to start compiling while I'm recording or editing because obviously that would ruin what I'm doing. You know, like this stream right here where we're on a Jitsi chat. I don't, all of a sudden, I don't want my CPU to be pegged at 100% compiling all those programs. So like every week or so when I remember it, I rebuild all the packages for DTOS so they get updated if there's a new version available. Oh, very cool. Yeah. Well, let's talk a little bit about your... Uh, since you're a video content creator, I love talking to people about, you know, how we accomplish some of what we accomplish. Let's talk about video editors, especially video editors on Linux, because they're a bit of a mess. What are you using to edit your videos? Well, you know, I, I started out using Shotcut uh, okay. because Caden Live was always kind of giving me issues. Crashy. It worked great for a while, and then, boom, you get an update. and. Yeah. Yeah, it would kind of, and then I went over to Caden Live uh, because it started getting really through the streak where it was kind of working really nice. And I kind of like in Caden Live the fact that you can um, save your presets. Yeah. So when you create all these different uh, effects and so forth, you can save those. And you couldn't do that in Shotcut. So 
to me, that was huge. And then I stumbled across uh, a website. It was an online video editor. Uh, what's that called? I got to pull it up real quick. Yeah. I always forget the name of it. <laughs> well, I, I will say that you, your comment about Caden Live, um, I remember Caden Live. Caden Live still can crash on you occasionally, but there was a period th three, four, five years back where Caden Live was really crashy. Like it loved to crash and it wasn't good at the time of saving um, your work where now Caden Live has this cool feature. If it does crash, which is kind of rare now that it crashes, but if it does, it will remember all the work you'd already put in. Even if you didn't save, it'll recover. That's nice. Because yeah, back, back in the, the day, I lost hours of work sometimes with where you didn't save and then it crashes. It's like, oh. <laughs> yeah, that's a real good feeling. Mm -hmm. I tell you. I've done that. Uh, yeah, the new one that I discovered here just recently, and in fact, the last two or three videos I made, I used uh, an online site called ClickChamp. ClickChamp, okay. I've never yeah. heard of that. Yeah. I was really, really impressed with them. Uh, mm -hmm. And I'm still using the free version. You get so much uh, in the free version. There's no watermarking. Um, I think this company was just bought out uh, last month by Microsoft. I was, I was actually going to ask if it was bought by Microsoft. <laughs> yeah. It would make sense. <laughs> and so that scared me a little, but it should, because that means this company is going to be dead in six months. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> Cause everything that Microsoft buys, it eventually dies. How about it? Yeah. yeah. So I'm kind of keeping that in mind as well. <laughs> uh, but um really impressed with uh, with the software, though, because I can edit in there and I don't have to keep saving my edits. And no. um, it's actually a very quick process and it gives me access to a lot of nice font effects mm -hmm. uh, and uh, video clips and so forth that I can access quickly without having to go and download them myself. Yep. So it actually turned out to be kind of convenient. Yeah, that's and cool. So I'm kind of combining that with Caden Live. I still use Caden Live uh, a lot of times when I want to kind of tweak it a little farther back to the next level. So you might call it kind of a hybrid process yeah. that I'm using. Yeah, I strictly use Caden Live for the most part if it's working. If, and this does happen, if Caden Live is for whatever reason broken with an update and I just can't get it to work, I can edit a video using Blender if I have to. I know how to use the video editor in Blender. Oh, I like and it's, it's not bad. It's very slow to render the video, though, once you go to render it. It's like takes twice as long to render a video as Caden Live. That's the only downside. But the actual putting the clips together and everything, it's actually really smooth. Uh, scrubbing through the video in Blender is really nice like it it, it it's, is and it's surprisingly easy to use yeah actually. it's really not bad yeah uh-huh it's almost perfect if they if they could fix the render speeds um yeah I'd probably would, use it over Caden live to be honest yeah that would definitely be a, a changer for me too because that's kind of where i would get stuck is on the the render speed yeah it's just you know because i i make so many videos I can't have something that typically would take 30 minutes to render, take an hour. Because if you're doing that for every single video you make and you make, I don't know, a couple hundred a year, that's a couple of hundred extra hours every year that I, I was waiting for videos to render that I wouldn't have had to wait had I just used Caden Live. And it adds up. It yeah. does. It really does. Uh, but it is surprisingly intuitive. I think the only obstacle I ran into in the very beginning was uh, setting your frames because mm -hmm. it would have a preset set of frames. The 22 and, frames per second or whatever the cinema, uh, whatever they record movies in. Yeah. Uh, yeah. You have to change it to 60 frames per second. Yeah. Uh, and then mm -hmm. um, I think there was also, uh, let me think it was a number of frames too, was another issue. Oh yeah. too, uh, Because it only has a really short, like you can only record about two minutes worth of video the way it's set up by default. Yeah. Right, right. Mm -hmm. And then I discovered this key binding that you could hit to mm -hmm. set it. 
automatically to cover the whole video. Yeah, I had to Google that <laughs> because I, I ran into the same problem. <laughs> And we talked about, of course, your, the artwork. You're probably using GIMP, and like for thumbnails, things like that. Or are you, you using online tools for that as well? Uh, no, for my thumbnails, I use uh, Inkscape and GIMP. Oh, cool. Yeah. Cool. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, now the the Inkscape is pretty much where I do all the designing and everything mm -hmm. because for me, it's it's very quick and intuitive, and I can do a lot in Inkscape. And then. Uh, I started integrating GIMP actually after watching one of your videos a couple years ago uh, when you kind of went over your process in GIMP where you would load the, the thumbnail in and then uh, set the saturation and the contrast. And uh, that that really made a difference for me after I started uh, kind of following suit there. That, wow. Well, one of the things with with the YouTube game is getting people to click on a video and many people don't realize this as important as the video in many cases is the thumbnail because what's the point of you making the video if nobody ever watches it and what's going to make people watch it seeing a thumbnail and making them click on it and one of the cool things you can do is yeah add some extra saturation or add a lot of contrast so and you know, go to the brightness contrast tool and Add, add a lot more contrast to the picture and you know it will make your thumbnail stand out from all those other thumbnails in the search results that are not doing that it really does and for me i kind of look th at that like a game changer for thumbnails mm -hmm. and it I, I can't imagine not doing that anymore oh. and you got a great point it's kind of like you can have the best product in the world but if you don't advertise it then it doesn't mean anything there's been a few videos i've made where I had an idea for a thumbnail and I made the thumbnail without having a video in mind. Then I'm like, I've got to make a video that fits this thumbnail. Now make it, this thumbnail is so good. Right? Now that's a cool idea. I'm going mm -hmm. to try that sometime. <laughs> um, one other thing you mentioned earlier about comments from your viewers uh, helping you out. Have you found the Linux YouTube community to be a friendly place? Oh, absolutely. Yeah, very friendly. In fact, uh, way more than I expected. When I first got into doing YouTube, I really kind of expected maybe a little bit of the opposite. You know, yeah. I really was thinking that, you know, these guys could probably be hostile if they wanted to. Mm -hmm. uh, my attitude going in was uh, when I was doing programming videos and so forth, I still really wasn't quite sure what kind of format I wanted to go with. But I thought maybe the best thing to do is just kind of let your audience define that for you. Let them kind of nudge you in directions where uh, they might like to see you go. And so I kind of did that. They they were, people were responsive right, right off the bat. No. I mean, yeah, I did have to go a couple of months making videos without probably hardly any views and barely any subscribers, but, uh, you know, it's, you got to keep in mind that it's all about the videos no. and providing content and loving what you're doing and everything else will just follow. Yeah. I mean, at the end of the day, yeah, you need to make the videos that you want to make because I mean, that's, if you're not having fun, what's the point? Right. Right. You got to yeah. enjoy it because right. I think that comes across when you're making your videos that, if, if you don't enjoy it, people are going to sense it. Because mm -hmm. I, I get, you know, I, I get a lot of comments about things I should do on video, avenues I should explore. And some of them are things I have absolutely no interest in. I know I'd never use it in real life. And I, I know I would just absolutely hate making that video. And I don't care how many people would watch that video. I'm not going to make it if I'm not going to enjoy the video because it, it's going to come across on video that I absolutely can't stand what I'm doing. And the reason I know this is because I see YouTubers like this. I'm sure you have too, where you watch their, their videos and they look like they're miserable making the content that they're making. And I don't want to be like that. Uh, same here. You know, I'll, I'll take a nudge, but it's got to be in a, in a direction yeah. that I go for sure. Um, yeah. Yeah. I, I found a, like the comments on my videos and community that, because there's a social aspect to YouTube in the comment section. I have found it 
overwhelmingly positive. They're obviously in any comment section, any kind of chat uh, format, social format, you're going to have jack wagons that are just there to troll, troll you, troll the other commenters. But those are actually the exception, not the rule. Like it's for the most part a pretty friendly place and you get a lot of people in the comment section that are trying to help each other with Linux installs or whatever software they're using. And it's, uh, yeah, I, I'm like you, I was surprised at how friendly it was when I first started this as well. I had to tell myself right from the beginning, try to ignore the trolls. They're going to probably be everywhere. You know? I like the trolls. Off your back. And I was one of the things I like about the trolls is uh, they do keep conversation going. Like when I get this one troll, that's all of a sudden he's just trolling everybody in the comments and then they're coming back at him. And next thing you know, you've got like 500 comments on this video that not that many people have watched. It's like, well, you know, that troll really helped me out there because he really got that comment section going. <laughs> <laughs> I like that. Yeah, mm -hmm. yeah. I've gotten a couple of flame wars on my channel as well yeah. uh, that are pretty entertaining. Yeah, that's another thing I get sometimes from new content creators is looking to start a channel. What, what about all the negative comments? And you know, what about them? They count toward the algorithm as well. Like, don't. Yeah. Don't yeah. take them personally. Like they, they're okay as long as they're commenting. I don't care what they say. I'm just glad they commented. <laughs> right. Exactly. That that means they they watched it. And yeah. Mm -hmm. you know, I noticed uh, you have a Odyssey channel as well because I'm on Odyssey and I see your videos pop up on there sometimes when I'm checking out content over there. Yeah, I set that up a couple, uh, probably a year and a half ago, mm -hmm. and that might have even been in inspired by your channel uh you, you do uh have a way of throwing some great ideas out there you should be a content creator <laughs> one day yeah <laughs> but yeah i love odyssey I've, I've been on it for a while i've since early on probably the first six months or so it was really getting started and i jumped on it and i've kind of promoted it kind of heavily so i think i'm one of the bigger channels on the entire platform I'm in the yeah. top 20 or 30 channels on the platform, which is kind of weird uh, for, you know, a Linux content creator because I'm not in the top 20 or 30 <laughs> channels on YouTube, right? <laughs> Probably not in the top 20 or 30 million on YouTube. <laughs> well, you know, as you said a long time ago in one of your videos, you, you kind of considered yourself a relatively big fish in a small pond. Yeah, um, I, unfortunately, Linux... It's still, I mean, we. it's growing. I see it growing. Free and open source software is definitely growing, but it's not mainstream yet. Not close to being mainstream. But I, I do see, there's definitely been a serious tide change here, I would say, in the last 10 years. Especially with companies like Microsoft in the last five years now really embracing the idea of open source software. I think that is a complete game changer. Even Google which is you know, as evil as Google can be, they've got a lot of open source code out there for people. Um, obviously, some of their operating systems like Android, and Chrome OS, there's some open source aspects to some of that stuff. And, and even these companies like Microsoft and Google, and Facebook, you know, all these companies, Apple, they're not as anti-open source as they once were. Yeah, that's true. I think they, they've kind of seen the light over the years. Well, I and, think they've realized that they they can make money off of it. Is what. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, that's the light they like. <laughs> yeah. When Google can sell, you know, a billion phones or whatever, Android devices every month, right? <laughs> or whatever the number is these days. I forget what the last time I checked on that. It's crazy how many new Android devices are activated every month. It's an insane number. Wow. Yeah, and hey, you know, Google's making money off Linux. I know, I'm happy for them. Oh, yeah. Um, <laughs> yeah well, I guess. Right. Uh, uh. You know, looping back to Odyssey, yeah, mm -hmm. I think one of the things that really attracted me to Odyssey as well was the fact that uh, you could uh, automatically send your YouTube videos and have them sync with the channel, which I thought was a great feature. Yeah. And, and I still and, do that. Fallback too, in case you ever get tossed from 
the YouTube platform. You never know. Uh, Even to this day, uh, I still just post to YouTube and it automatically syncs to Odyssey. I don't post to Odyssey myself. I just don't have that kind of time. And actually, Odyssey now has the ability, if I wanted to, I could post to Odyssey first and have it sync to YouTube. I think I could go the other direction if I wanted to. Uh, now, that's cool. I didn't I know. realize that. Odyssey now has the ability for live streaming. So that's another kind of newer thing that hasn't been around too long. Um, and there's a lot of new features to Odyssey. When I first joined, you couldn't comment on the videos. Now there's comments. Uh, when you first, when they first introduced comments, there was no moderation. I had no ma way to moderate the comments. So if somebody just spammed the heck out of my comments, I couldn't get rid of all these spam links. Now there's moderator controls where I can actually delete comments and block users and things like that that didn't exist a year ago. Oh, it's gotten okay. a lot better. Odyssey is a real competitor to YouTube. Yeah, I can, I can definitely see that. I mean. Uh, right from the get-go, I think they had some pretty innovative features. Yeah. For sure. Yeah. Well, Jack, that was really all the questions I had for you. You got any uh, final uh, thoughts or anything you want to bring up before the end of the conversation? Well, you know, nothing nothing too technical, I suppose. But uh, I got to tell you, uh, I really appreciate the fact that you uh, invited me on. Uh, caught the user's comment. I think that was a Bainey one, I think is how you pronounce that. But mm -hmm. he's been around since he was one of my first subscribers, I think, one mm -hmm. of the top seven or so. And so I was, I remember responding to him and saying that I was open to that and uh, really actually quite surprised when, when you chimed in there and, and responded. And so I really... Uh, appreciate you having me on. I think that was a lot of fun. Yeah, this was fun. Really do too yeah. much in the way of, in fact, this is my first collab. So, yeah, yeah I, I admit it. <laughs> yeah. Well, but, you know how it is with us Linux users. We're used to doing everything alone, right? We're, we're not social animals, right? <laughs> right, right. We kind of live under a rock and, and yeah. our videos. <laughs> well, well, thanks for hanging out with me, Jag. Uh, do you have any uh, contact information you want to disclose? Obviously, I'm going to link to your YouTube channel. I'll link to your Odyssey channel as well because I have that. Any other social media um, links or anything you want to promote? Oh, thanks. Well, I, I'm also on Mastodon. Uh, okay. I've got a fairly new uh, account there. And uh, I think I'm at Jack Keeper at Mastodon. Well, I'll tell you what, uh, give me your Mastodon link in an email after this. And I'll make sure to link to that. Anybody wants to contact you on Mastodon. Well, thanks. I appreciate that very much. All right. All right. Well, Jack, thanks for chatting with me. Best of luck in your YouTube channel and any other endeavors. All right. Thanks so much, Derek. Peace. Great chatting with you. All right. <laughs>